Please join me in our call to worship. He was despised, a man of suffering, and we held him of no account. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. God is not far from us in times of trouble and darkness. Let us trust in God to lead us to despair. Let us pray. Grieving God. On the cross, your son embraced death even as he had embraced life. Faithfully and with good courage. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may hold fast to our faith in him, exalted, and may find mercy in all times of need. Amen. Would you stand and join us in singing together hymn 216, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. As we continue our journey through this holy week, let us in this hour confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Will you please join me in the prayer found printed in your bulletin? Most merciful God, we confess to you the horror of our sin. You come to us in love to save us, yet we have rejected your love and crucified the one who is our only hope. Have mercy on us, O God. Give us the grace to acknowledge our need, to repent of our denials and betrayals, and to stand faithfully before the cross of Christ, crucifying our sins with him and waiting hopefully for our new life through him. As we continue our worship service together, I invite you to join me in this prayer of illumination as we 
begin to meditate upon God's word, both in uh, God's holy scripture and also in our anthems that the choir will present. Will you pray with me? Guide us, O God, by your word and your spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now a reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 through 39. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, "Are you the king of the Jews?" He answered him, "You say so." 
And the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus made no further reply. Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to, to do for them according to this custom. They answered, then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. The chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish for me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them why. What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it upon him, and they began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Uh, they compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he would not take it. And they crucified him. They divided his clothes among them. They cast lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits. One on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself! Come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves, saying he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. And when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Aloi, Aloi, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it. They said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone else ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And then Jesus gave a loud cry, breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was God's son. The word of the Lord. Not too much time passes after the crucifixion of Jesus that the cross of Christ becomes sign and symbol of the Christian faith. We wear them around our necks. We place the cross front and center in our sanctuaries. We sing triumphantly, lift high the cross. All this giving power and glorification to what was once a symbol and a place for the powerless exalting what was once, in fact, a very gruesome and absurd form of capital punishment. 
And yet even the Apostle Paul would write about the power of the cross and how it is, quote, a symbol of hope. And for Christians, it is that indeed. Only on that day at Golgotha, it was anything but a symbol of hope. It was what it was designed to be, a method of slow execution, death. I remember as a youth being filled with terror at a somewhat evangelical church camp. I was probably 12 years old at the time. My small group leader said this. He said, Jesus died for you. In fact, every time you sin, you're putting another nail in him. You think you know about the cross, what it must be like? He, would, he, he continued, they would mount him on the cross first and then with nails already in place, they would raise the cross and they would drop into a, a, a six deep inch de, or foot deep hole and they dropped him. You can imagine the skin tearing off his already bloodied hands as his weight shifted and the post settled into that deep hole. My God, that hit hard. Was I doing that to Jesus every time I sinned? I took some comfort from those words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they were doing. I was 12. I did not know what I was doing. Although in retrospect, I'm not sure this overly zealous youth leader knew what he was doing in his explanation of what was happening at the cross. For all the pain our Savior bore because of my sin, because of your sins, of the world's sin, even the tearing of the flesh, O sacred head now wounded by a crown of thorns, I wonder if the greatest wasn't encapsulated in that one word from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The experience of being forsaken Worse than the beating, worse than the nails, worse than the drop in the hole, perhaps it is curious that in Mark's account of the crucifixion, this is the only word we get from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some have called this particular moment the crucifixion within the crucifixion. What it amounts to is complete and utter aloneness, complete and utter rejection for consider all that led to this moment, Jesus betrayed by one disciple, denied by another, abandoned by his closest companions, except some women, yet Mark is very deliberate, I believe, in stating that they too were standing at a distance. A far cry from John's description of Mary and John and another Mary standing at the foot of the cross. The crowd who had greeted him with loud hosannas now shout, crucify him, sealing Pilate's order of execution. As one commentator observes, quote, he is dead before he is crucified, for he is utterly alone. In Mark's account of the crucifixion, Jesus is completely alone through the whole experience. As pastors, especially in the time of death, we like to bring comfort with the words of the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd, even though I walk through the valley of death, you are with me, I fear no evil. And yet it is another Psalm 22 that directly precedes that, which is echoed in these words of Jesus from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whether Jesus was or was not completely alone, was forsaken, we cannot deny how he felt in that moment. This word expressed his dying word. Jesus, who finds himself in that moment of such great pain and agony to which he can only cry out, my God. As we find ourselves this evening in worship, invited to consider this word from the cross, this, this sole word, according to the Gospel of Mark. And what does it mean for us that Jesus, in that moment, questions if God has forsaken him? 
He who by his own admission convicted and sentenced to death, death on a cross with the belief this act would not only serve God's purpose for humankind, but would indeed bring God glory. For context, I think it's important that we consider Mark's timeline of the events and description of Jesus' last moments leading up to the cross. For the word that directly precedes this word from the cross is three hours of nothing but darkness. That these words from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, are those that break open the silence and darkness that have held its grip for three hours over the land. What was going on in those three hours of darkness and silence? Certain scholars hold it was that moment in which Jesus literally bore the weight of the sin of the world. To consider that Jesus bore the weight of the sin of the world, one who never in his own life had experienced the burden of sin, how can we even imagine the torment? So that when Jesus emerges from this saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We might note that for the original Greek, it's best interpreted, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? If sin and the consequence of sin can be understood as separation from God, as many contend, then surely the kind of separation Jesus felt bearing the weight of the sin of all of us can hardly imagine the pain, the agony. Beyond that, the certain knowledge that the closer our relationship with God, the more that period of separation would weigh upon us. Can you imagine for the one who had such an intimate relationship with the Father? Maybe it is a suffering worse than nails through hands and feet, the drop of the cross into the ground. So that whether he was indeed utterly alone in that moment or merely sensed a separation from the Father like none he had ever before known, his cry breaks the silence of those three hours of darkness covering the land in an all too human cry, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, as everything else leading up to this moment at the cross, as Jesus continually reminds the disciples, it is necessary. It is necessary that this cup not be taken from him. Because God so loved the world. To consider that for those moments when perhaps we have felt separation from God, we have experienced suffering where our faith in God and God's presence with us has been tested. That Jesus experienced separation from God, suffering, where his faith was tested because God so loved the world that the word was made flesh to enter our condition, to understand our condition, because God so loved the world, each and every one of us. The challenges that suffering present to faith are real, and they are reasonable. And this word from the cross brings that fully into the spotlight. Like Job before him, Jesus wants to know if God is good, if God is all-powerful, is all-loving, why? Why does this suffering happen? Why is there this feeling of abandonment. Indeed, Jesus, in the midst of great anguish, he wants to know, he raises the question, why? And I think this is such an important question, so central to our faith. Even as we can be assured that God is with us in our suffering, those moments we feel alone and desperately clinging to hope, hope revealed in an empty tomb, but first on a cross and a method of execution. For indeed, if God would go to the cross for us, go even to the depths of hell for us, then God knows and understands real suffering. And yet, even assured of that, we can still 
ask, why? Why is this? Whatever valley we are traveling through, why is this happening, God? Why? Are you there? Jesus, in this moment on the cross, the questioning why, and asking why, we see that Jesus, even in this hour of great anguish, still asks a question and has faith that God will hear him. He still trusts that God is there with him, but all the faith in the world, or otherworldly, does not keep from shouting out the question that tears at the very soul of all who suffer. Why? Because Jesus asks it from the cross, we can be certain it is the right question and a profoundly human and understandable one at that. Just as we may find ourselves in the midst of an experience or of a suffering to ask, why? Perhaps our faith in God and in God's presence shaken in that moment. As we consider this word from the cross, as we consider his passion, as we worship together this Good Friday, might we meditate on a couple of things this Mark passage may be speaking to us. The first is this, that Jesus did this, this act of suffering for us. And the example that suffering be for the sake of another, which is a very uncommon suffering, it is a selfless suffering when we consider the selfless act on the cross the humility by which jesus approached this event that he knew he must endure we are convicted that if god would do this then surely god would be with us in our suffering however it may manifest itself and that is incredibly good news and secondly to recognize that this in this act of suffering and sacrifice jesus was indeed or at least felt indeed truly forsaken there are those today who still suffer alone and yet we who have been drawn to christ gathered to this place we can take comfort that when we encounter trials that test our faith when we suffer in those darkest valleys, we have a community that is here to surround us and to care for us, and it is one born by that sacrifice on the cross. A community of believers united in Christ which loves one another, which cares for one another, that does not judge one another, especially in our suffering. Share one another's burdens to be able in one voice together to ask that question, why? Even as we pray for those and pray to be present for those who do indeed themselves find this day forsaken. As those who know that because God so loved the world, we are never alone. By the grace of God, may complete in the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, yes, a method of execution and pain and suffering, but also what would, by grace, become a realized sign of hope and power. We are able today to say, to proclaim that we are not alone. God with us in our suffering and in our joy. God with us individually, and as a community of faith. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the word that breaks the silence, the weight of suffering for our sin. May we never fear crying out to God in our moments of suffering, or to speak out for those who suffer alone today. For we are all one in Christ, united in his death which opens the way to life. For God so loved the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Dear people of God, God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, by your Spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you. We pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind. We pray for the hungry, the homeless, the destitute, the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful, the bereaved, for prisoners and captives, that God will comfort and relieve them, and grant the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, creator of the peoples of the earth, lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray. Eternal God of unchanging power and light, look with mercy upon your whole church. Bring to completion your saving work so that the whole world may see the fallen lifted up, the old made new, and all things brought to perfection by him through whom all things were made, our Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, the one crucified for us, who lived for us and died for us, teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our closing song tonight is, Were You There? Uh, it says in the bulletin to stand, but I would invite us to stay seated, uh, sing together. Um, a cappella, and uh, when we are done singing, you stick around as long as you want and enjoy the silence of this place, and we'll see you on the other side of the tomb on Sunday.
tremble.